Intellectual and Manual Labor, a Critique of Epistemology by Alfred Stone Ruthel. Um, this is chapter one to five. I guess the chapters are really short. So, chapter one. The Fetishism of Intellectual Labor. A critique needs a well-defined object at which it is directed. We choose philosophical epistemology. What is the salient feature which marks it as our particular object? Which philosophy most significantly represents it and is most rewarding to criticize? From the introduction, it is clear that our choice has fallen upon the Kantian theory of cognition. This does not, however, mean that the reader must be a specialist in this particularly daunting philosophy. Far from it. Marx clarifies the the object of his critique as follows. Let me point out once and for all that by a classical political economy, I mean all the economists who, since the time of W. Petty, have investigated the real internal framework of bourgeois relations of production, as opposed to the vulgar economists. Classical political economy in the sense of this definition culminated in the work of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, and accordingly, the discussion of their theories bulks largest in Marx's critical studies. For instance, those collected as theories of surplus value. This does not, however, oblige anyone to embark upon a study of Smith and Ricardo before reading Marx, even though, conversely, it is essential to have read Marx before looking at Smith and Ricardo. Marx's work in in economics starts where the peak of bourgeois economics reaches its limits. Can we draw any parallel to this framework of the Marxian critique to elucidate our own undertaking in the field of philosophical epistemology? I understand by this name, the epistemology which, since the time of Descartes, seized upon the newly founded natural science of the mathematical and experimental method established by Galileo. Thus, we describe philosophical epistemology as the theory of scientific knowledge undertaken with the aim of elaborating a coherent, all-embracing ideology to suit the production relations of bourgeois society. This endeavor culminated in the main works of Kant, especially his critique of pure reason. I therefore confine my main attention to Kant's philosophy of science which I consider to be the classical manifestation of the bourgeois fetishism of intellectual labor. Smith and Kant have in common that each is the first to have placed his respective discipline on a systematic foundation. Kant might at his time have been introduced to an English public as the Adam Smith of epistemology, and at the same period Smith could have been recommended to a German audience as the Immanuel Kant of political economy. However, in the light of Engels's Ludwig Feuerbach and the outcome of classical German philosophy and his survey of the whole movement since Kant, one might feel inclined to rank Hegel above Kant, especially since Ricardo was frequently placed on a level with his contemporary Hegel in comparison with Smith and Kant. While both the latter in their own fields evolved the postulates which a fully fledged bourgeois society should be expected to realize, Ricardo and Hegel, independently of each other, faced up to the inherent contradictions revealed by that society upon the achievement of this realization, brought about by the advent of the French Revolution of 1789-94 to and its Napoleonic aftermath. But there is one important difference which sets Hegel on a plane apart from Ricardo. He discarded the epistemological approach altogether and outstripped the limitations of the critical standards of thinking observed by Kant and adhered to by Ricardo in order to lift himself to the height of to the height of speculative and absolute idealism. This gave him free reign to carry philosophy to its consummation, but it makes him unsuited as the object for my own critique. Many a good Marxist will want to join issue with me on this apparently disparaging treatment of Hegel. For was not Hegel, after all, the discoverer of dialectics, and does not Marx accept him as such? 
The mystification which dialectic suffers in Hegel's hands by no means prevents him from being the first to present its general form of working in a comprehensive and conscious manner. With him, it is standing on its head. It must be inverted in order to discover the rational kernel within the mystical shell. True, this is what Marx says of Hegel in regard to the dialectic. But some Marxists have joined issue with Marx himself for leaving this vital subject so incompletely elucidated. I must say that I have never felt quite convinced that to advance from the critical idealism of Kant to the critical materialism of Marx, the road should necessarily lead via the absolute idealism of Hegel. There should be the possibility of connecting Kant and Marx by a direct route, at least systematically, which would also yield an understanding of dialectics as the critical and self-critical approach without first presenting it in the misleading guise of a system of, lo of logic. Nevertheless, I admit that the dialectic as evolved by Hegel a form affords a way of thinking which is infinitely superior to the fixed dualism of Kant. But the complaint about its dualism can affect the Kantian mode of thought only as bourgeois philosophy, and there it does it a service. For the unyielding dualism of this philosophy is surely a more faithful reflection of the realities of capitalism than can be found in the efforts of the illustrious post-Kantians striving to rid themselves of it by drawing all and everything into the redeeming imminency of the mind. How can the truth of the bourgeois world present itself other than as dualism? Hegel realized that the ideal of the truth could not acquiesce with it as the ultimate state of affairs, and he engaged on dialectics as a road transcending the bourgeois limitations. Therein lies his greatness and the importance of the impulse that emanated from the dynamic of this conception. But he could not himself step out of the bourgeois world at his epoch, and so he attained the unity outreaching Kant only by dispensing with the epistemological critique, and hence by way of hypostasis. He did not make thinking and being one, and did not inquire how they could be one. He simply argued that the idea of the truth demands them to be one, and if logic and if logic I'm lost, and if logic is to be the logic of the truth, it has to start with that unity as its presupposition. But what is the kind of being with which thinking could be hypostasized as one, and their unity be a system of logic? It was nothing more and nothing more real than the being implied when I say, I am I. Since after all, M is the first person singular of the verb to be in its present tense. And so Hegel starts his dialectics by a process of the mind within the mind. The Hegelian dissolution of the Kantian antithesis is not achieved by dissolving them, but by making them perform as a process. The Hegelian dialectics has no other legitimacy than that it is a process occurring. Questioned as to its possibility, it would prove impossible. Adorno was perfectly right in saying, if the Hegelian synthesis did work out, it would only be the wrong one. When Marx in the last of his theses on Feuerbach wrote, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Hegel must have been foremost in his thoughts, because in his philosophy, the very dialectics of the real change is wasted on merely ontologizing the idea. What else could this idea be as an outcome of the dialectic as logic, but the idealization of the bourgeois world rising to the height of thinking and being, embracing each other in the perfection of the bourgeois state as the Prussian paragon of the constitutional monarchy? A similar treatment is meted out to all the spheres to which Hegel extended his speculation, that of the law, the mind, aesthetics, religion, history, and even nature. To them, all the same pattern of logic could be made applicable by modifying the kind of being that entered into unity with thinking in each particular field. I am well aware that stressing only its negative side distorts Hegel's philosophy out of recognition by suppressing the immense wealth 
and depth of content it owes to the revolutionary impulse of the dialectic. Hegel's is a philosophy which might be said to be wrapped in twilight from beginning to end, and I do not want my few remarks to be misunderstood as being a general condemnation of this outstanding work. My concern is narrowly confined to one question only, the treatment of the Kantian epistemology by Hegel on the one hand and Marx on the other. Thus, it is easy to see what Hegel's interest was in dispensing with the epistemological inquiry of Kant, but it was surely not the Marxian interest to do likewise. The Hegelian motivation was rooted in the mystification of the dialectic, which aroused Marx's criticism. Marx's elimination of the Kantian kind of inquiry should not be understood simply as an imitation of Hegel's. Marx must have had his own independent reasons for it. Grounded in his materialistic conception of the dialectic, not in the idealistic one of Hegel. The Kantian, the Kantian inquiry was aimed at an explanation of the phenomenon of the human intellect, such as it manifested itself in the mathematical science founded by Galileo and perfected by Newton. What was wrong with Kant's inquiry was that he looked into the nature of the human mind for an answer. Marx could only be satisfied with an answer drawn from natural history and the human departure from it in social and economic developments arising from man's producing his own means of livelihood. This kind of answer could not possibly be gained from Hegel's philosophy, but it is this answer that we have in mind when we suggest a direct cut through from Kant to Marx by way of a critical liquidation of Kant's inquiry, rather than by purely discarding it. Chapter 2. Can there be abstraction other than by thought? Forms of thought and forms of society have one thing in common. They are both forms. The Marxian mode of thought is characterized by a conception of form, which distinguishes it from all other schools of thinking. It derives from Hegel, but this only so as to deviate from him again. For Marx, form is time-bound. It originates, dies, and changes within time. To conceive of form in this way is characteristic of dialectical thought. But with Hegel, its originator, the genesis and mutation of form is only within the power of the mind. It constitutes the science of logic. Form processes in any other field. See nature or history, Hegel conceived only in the pattern of logic. The, Hege the Hegelian concept of dialectic finally entitles the mind not only to primacy over manual work, but endows it with omnipotence. Marx, on the other hand, understands the time governing the genesis and the mutation of forms as being from the very first historical time the time of natural and of human history. That is why the form processes cannot be made out in anticipation. No prima philosophia under any guise has a place in Marxism. What is to be asserted must first be established by investigation. Historical materialism is merely the name for a methodological postulate, and even this only became clear to Marx as a result of my studies. Thus, one must not ignore the processes of abstraction at work in the emergence of historical forms of consciousness. Abstraction can be likened to the workshop of conceptual thought, and its process must be a materialistic one if the assertion that consciousness is determined by social being is to hold true. A, de a derivation of consciousness from social being presupposes a process of abstraction, which is part of this being. Only so can we validate the statement that the social being of man determines his consciousness. But with this point of view, the historical materialist stands in irreconcilable opposition to all traditional theoretical philosophy. For this entire tradition, it is an established fact that abstraction is the inherent activity and the exclusive privilege of thought. To speak of abstraction in any other sense is regarded as irresponsible unless, of course, one uses the word merely metaphorically. 
but to acquiesce in this philosophical tradition would preclude the realization of the postulate of historical materialism. If the formation of the consciousness by the procedure of abstraction is exclusively a matter for the consciousness itself, then a chasm opens up between the forms of consciousness on the one side and its alleged determination in being on the other. The historical materialist would deny in theory the existence of this chasm, but in practice has no solution to offer, none at any rate that would bridge for the chasm. Admittedly, it must be taken into consideration that the philosophical tradition is itself a product of the division between mental and manual labor, and since its beginning with Pythagoras, Heraclitus, and Parmenides, Parmenides has been a preserve of intellectuals for intellectuals, inaccessible to manual workers. Little has changed here, even today. For this reason, the testimony of this tradition, even if unanimous, does not carry the weight of authority for those who take their stand with the manual worker. The view that abstraction was not the exclusive, exclusive property of the mind, but arises in commodity exchange, was first expressed by Marx in the beginning of Capital and earlier in the Critique of Political Economy of 1859 where he speaks of an abstraction other than that of thought. Chapter 3. The Commodity Abstraction The form of commodity is abstract, and abstractness governs its whole orbit. To begin with exchange, or to begin with, exchange value is itself abstract value in contrast to the use value of commodities. The exchange value is subject only to quantitative differentiation, and this quantification is again abstract compared with the quantity which measures use values. Marx points out with particular emphasis that even labor, when determining the magnitude and substance of value, becomes abstract human labor, human labor purely as such. The form in which commodity value takes on its concrete appearance as money, be it as coinage or banknotes, is an abstract thing which strictly speaking, is a contradiction in terms. In the form of money, riches become abstract riches, and as owner of such riches, man himself becomes an abstract man, a private property owner. Lastly, a society in which commodity exchange forms the nexus rerum is a purely abstract set of relations where everything concrete is in private hands. The essence of commodity abstraction, however, is that it is not thought-induced. It does not originate in men's minds, but in their actions. And yet this does not give abstraction a merely metaphorical meaning. It is abstraction in its precise, literal sense. The economic concept of value resulting from it is characterized by a complete absence of quality, a differentiation purely by quantity and by applicabil applicability to every kind of commodity and service which can occur on the market. These qualities of the economic value abstraction indeed display a striking similarity with fundamental categories of quantifying natural science without, admittedly, the slightest inner relationship between these heterogeneous spheres being as yet recognizable. While the concepts of natural science are thought abstractions, the economic concept of value is a real one. It exists nowhere other than in the human mind, but it does not spring from it. Rather, it is purely social in character, arising in the spatio-temporal sphere of human interrelations. It is not people who originate these abstractions, but their actions. They do this without being aware of it. In order to do justice to Marx's critique of political economy, the commodity or value abstraction revealed in his analysis must be viewed as a real abstraction resulting from spatio-temporal activity. Understood in this way, Marx's discovery stands in irreconcilable contradiction to the entire tradition of theoretical philosophy, and this contradiction must be brought into the open by critical co confrontation of the two conflicting standpoints. But such a confrontation does not form part of the Marxian analysis.
I agree with Louis Althusser that in the theoretical foundations of capital, more fundamental issues are at stake than those showing in the purely economic argument. Althusser believes that capital is the answer to a question implied but not formulated by Marx. Althusser, depe sorry, Althusser defeats the purpose of his search for this question by insisting que la production de la connaissance constitue un processus qui se passe tout entier dans la pensée. He understands Marx on the commodity abstraction metaphorically, whereas it should be taken literally and its epistemological implications pursued so as to grasp how Marx's method turns Hegel's dialectic right side up. The unproclaimed theme of capital and of, of the commodity analysis is in fact the real abstraction uncovered there. Its scope reaches further than e economics. Indeed, it concerns the heritage of philosophy far more directly than it concerns political economy. Some people go further and accuse Marx of having ignored the epistemological implications of his own mode of thinking. Here, I agree that if one takes up these implications and pursues them consistently, Epistemology itself undergoes a radical transformation and indeed merges into a theory of society. However, I believe that the fallacies of the epistemological and idealistic traditions are more effectively eliminated if one does not talk of the theory of knowledge, but the division of mental and manual labor instead. For them, the practical significance of the whole inquiry becomes apparent. If the contradiction between the real abstraction in Marx and the thought abstraction in the theory of knowledge is not brought to any critical confrontation, one must acquiesce with the total lack of connection between the scientific form of thought and the historical social process. Mental and manual labor must remain divided. This means, however, that one must also acquiesce with the persistence of social class division, even if this assumes the form of socialist bureaucratic rule. Marx's omission of the theory of knowledge results in the lack of a theory of mental and manual labor. It is, in other words, the theoretical omission of a precondition of a classless society which was seen by Marx himself to be fundamental. The political implication heightens its theoretical importance, for not only must the conception of history be broadened to include science, but also its method must be a consistently critical one. For Marx arrives at the correct understanding of things only by critically tracing the causes that give rise to the false consciousness operating in class society. Thus, to the conditions of classless society we must add, in agreement with Marx, the unity of mental and manual labor, or as he puts it, the disappearance of their division. And the present study maintains that an adequate insight can only be gained into the conditions of a classless society by investigating the origin of the division of head and hand. This involves a critique of, of philosophical epistemology, which is the false consciousness arising from this division. The Marxian concept of critique owes its parentage to Kant. In his... In his critique of pure reason. We now apply in full circle the principle of critique in this sense to the Kantian epistemology. This is the classical manifestation of the bourgeois fetishism embodied in the mental labor of science. We must trace the division of mental and manual labor back to its earliest occurrence in history. This origin we date from the beginnings of Greek philosophy because its antecedents in Egypt and Mesopotamia are pre-scientific. Our task now amounts to the critical demonstration of the commodity abstraction. This is only a reformulation of what was previously referred to as critical confrontation. We have to prove that the exchange abstraction is, first, a real historical occurrence in time and space, and second, that it is an abstraction in the strict sense acknowledged in epistemology. This inquiry must be preceded by a description of the phenomenon under investigation. Chapter 4. 
the phenomenon of the exchange abstraction. The Marxist concept of commodity abstraction refers to the labor which is embodied in the commodities and which determines the magnitude of their value. The value creating labor is termed abstract human labor to differentiate it from concrete labor which creates use values. Our main concern is to clarify this commodity abstraction and to trace its origin to its roots. It must be stated from the outset that our analysis of exchange and value differs in certain respects from that of Marx in the opening of Volume 1 of Capital, without, for that matter, contradicting his analysis. Marx was concerned with a critique of political economy, while our subject is the theory of scientific knowledge and its historical materialist critique. However, Marx himself has defined the aspect of exchange as it concerns our purpose. However long a series of periodical reproductions and preceding accumulations, the capital functioning today may have passed through, it always preserves its original virginity. So long as the laws of exchange are observed in every single act of exchange taken in isolation, the mode of appropriation of the surplus can be completely re revolutionized without in any way affecting the property rights which correspond to commodity production. The same rights remain in force both at the outset, when the product belongs to its producer, who, exchanging equivalent for equivalent, can enrich himself only by his own labor, and in the period of capitalism, when social wealth becomes to an ever-increasing degree the property of those who are in a position to appropriate the unpaid labor of others over and over again. Hence, the formal structure of commodity exchange in every single act remains the same throughout the various stages of commodity production. I am concerned exclusively with this formal structure which takes no account of the relationship of value to labor. Indeed, where labor is taken into consideration, we are in the field of economics. Our interest is confined to the abstraction contained in exchange, which we which we shall find determines the conceptual mode of thinking peculiar to societies based on commodity production. In order to pursue our particular purpose of tracing to its origin the abstraction permeating commodity exchange, we slightly modify the starting base of the analysis. Marx begins by distinguishing use value and exchange value as the major contrasting aspects of every commodity. We trace these aspects to the different human activities to which they correspond, the actions of use and the action, action of exchange. The relationship between these two contrasting kinds of activity, use and exchange, is the basis of the con contrast in relationship between use value and exchange value. The explanation of the abstraction of exchange is contained in this relationship. The point is that use and exchange are not only different and contrasting by description, but are mutually exclusive in time. They must take place separately at different times. This is because exchange serves only a change of ownership, a change that is in terms of a purely social status of the commodities as owned property. In order to make this change possible on a basis of negotiated agreement, the physical condition of the commodities, their material status, must remain unchanged, or at any rate must be assumed to remain unchanged. Commodity exchange cannot take place as a recognized social institution unless this separation of exchange from use is stringently observed. This is a truth which needs only be uttered to be convincing, and I regard it as a firm basis on which to build far-reaching conclusions. First, therefore, let us be clear as to the specific nature of this particular restriction of use. For there are, of course, countless situations apart from exchange where the use of things is stopped, hindered, interrupted, or otherwise disputed. None of these have the same significance as exchange. Things may be stored for later use, others put on one side for the children. Wine may be kept in the cellar to mature injured bodies be ordered arrest, and so on. 
These are stoppages or delays of use decided upon by the users themselves and done in the service of their use. Whether they happen in a private household or on the wider basis of production carried on in common with other people, cases of this kind are not on a level comparable with exchange because use here is not forbidden by social command or necessity. But social interference occurs wherever there is exploitation without, for that reason, be alone being necessarily similar to exchange. Long before there was commodity production, exploitation assumed one of the many forms of what Marx had termed direct lordship and bondage. This is exploitation based on unilateral appropriation as opposed to the reciprocity of exchange. In ancient Bronze Age Egypt, for instance, priests and scribes and other servants of the pharaoh were engaged to collect surplus produce from the Nilotic peasants and put it into storage. Once the produce was collected, neither the peasant producers nor the collectors had access to these goods for their own use, for the power and authority for the collection emanated from the pharaoh. There was a transference of property, but a public, not a private one, and there was the same immutability of the material status of the products held in store for disposal by the ruling authorities, which applies in the case of commodities in exchange. There were significant formal similarities between Bronze Age Egypt or Babylonia and Iron Age Greece, and we shall find it in the second part of this study that the protoscience which emerged in the ancient oriental civilizations can be accounted for on these grounds. But the great difference is that the social power imposing this control over the use of things was in the nature of the personal authority of the pharaoh obeyed by every member of the ruling setup. In an exchange society based on commodity production, however, the social power has lost this personal character, and in its place is an anonymous necessity which forces itself upon every individual commodity owner. The whole of the hierarchical superstructure of the Egyptian society has disappeared, and the control over the use and disposal of things is now exercised anarchically by the mechanism of the market in accordance with the laws of private property which are in fact the laws of the separation of exchange and use. Thus, the salient feature of the act of exchange is that its separation from use has assumed the compelling necessity of an objective social law. Wherever commodity exchange takes place, it does so in effective abstraction from use. This is an abstraction not in mind, but in fact. It is a state of affairs prevailing at a definite place and lasting a definite time. It is the state of affairs which reigns on the market. There, in the marketplace and in shop windows, things stand still. They are under the spell of one activity only, to change owners. They stand there waiting to be sold. While they are there for exchange, they are there not for use. A commodity marked out at a definite price, for instance, is looked upon as being frozen to absolute immutability throughout the time during which its price remains unaltered. And the spell does not only bind the doings of man. Even nature herself is supposed to abstain from any ravages in the body of this commodity and to hold her breath, as it were, for the sake of this social business of man. Evidently, even the aspect of non-human nature is affected by the banishment of use from the sphere of exchange. The abstraction from use in no way implies, however, that the use value of the commodities is of no concern in the market. Quite the contrary. While exchange banishes use from the actions of marketing people, it does not banish it from their minds. However, it must remain confined to their minds, occupying them in their imagination and thoughts only. This is not to say that their thoughts need lack reality. Customers have the right to ascertain the use value of the commodities on offer. They may examine them at close quarters, touch them, try them out, or try them on, ask to have them demonstrated if the case arises. And the demonstration should be identically like the use for which the commodity is or is not acquired. On standards of empiricism, no difference should prevail between the use 
on show and the use in practice. This, however, is the difference that matters on the business standards which rule in the market. Of a commodity in the market, the empirical data come under reservations, like those argued in subjective idealism. Material reality accrues to them when the object is out of the market and passes, by virtue of the money paid into the private sphere of the acquiring customer. It is certain that the customers think of commodities as objects of use, or nobody would bother to exchange them, and confidence tricksters would be out of business. The banishment of use during exchange is entirely independent of what the specific use may be and can be kept in the private minds of the exchanging agents. Buyers and sellers of sodium chlorate might have gardening in mind or bomb making. Thus, in speaking of the abstractness of exchange, we must be careful not to apply the term to the consciousness of the exchanging agents. They are supposed to be occupied with the use of the commodities they see, but occupied in their imagination only. It is the action of exchange and the action alone that is abstract. The consciousness and the action of the people part company and exchange and go different ways. We have to trace their ways separately and also their interconnection. As commodity production develops and becomes the typical form of production, man's imagination grows more and more separate from his actions and becomes increasingly individualized, eventually assuming the dimension of a private consciousness. This is a phenomenon deriving its origin not from the private sphere of use, but precisely from the public one of the market. The individualized consciousness also is beset by abstractness, but this is not the abstractness of the act of exchange at its source. For the abstractness of that action cannot be noted when it happens, since it only happens because the consciousness of its agents is taken up with their business and with the empirical appearance of things which pertains to their use. One could say that the abstractness of their action is beyond realization by the actors because their very consciousness stands in the way. Were the abstractness to catch their minds, their action would cease to be exchange and the abstraction would not arise. Nevertheless, the abstractness of exchange does enter their minds, but only after the event, when they are faced with the completed result of the circulation of the commodities. The chief result is money in which the abstractness assumes a separate embodiment. Then, however, the movement through which the process has been mediated vanishes in its own result, leaving no trace behind. This will occupy us more fully later on. Here we want to return once more to the separation of exchange from use and to its basic nature. When looking at use and exchange as kinds of human practice, it becomes plain to see in what manner they exclude each other either can take place only while the other does not. The practice of use covers a well-nigh unlimited field of human activities. In fact, it embraces all the material processes by which we live as bodily beings on the bosom of Mother Earth, so to speak, comprising the entirety of what Marx terms man's interchange with nature in his labor of production and his enjoyment of consumption. This material practice of man is at a standstill, or assumed to be at a standstill, while the other practice, that of exchange, holds sway. This practice has no meaning in terms of nature. It is purely social by its constitution and scope. Not an atom of matter enters into the objectivity of commodities as values. In this, it is the direct opposite of the coarsely sensuous objectivity of commodities as physical bodies. The point is that notwithstanding the negation that exchange implies of the physical realities of use and use value, the transfer of possession negotiated under property laws in no way lacks physical reality itself. Exchange involves the movement of the commodities in time and space from owner to owner and constitutes events of no less physical reality than the activities of use which it rules out. It is indeed precisely because their physical reality is on a par that both kinds of practice, exchange and use, are mutually exclusive in time. It is in its capacity of a real event in time and space 
that the abstraction applies to exchange. It is, in its precise meaning, a real abstraction, and the use from which the abstraction is made encompasses the entire range of sense reality. Thus, we have, on the basis of commodity production, two spheres of spatio-temporal reality side by side, yet mutually exclusive and of sharply contrasting description. It would help us to have names by which we could designate them. In German, the world of use is of ten, is often called the first or primary nature, material and substance. While the sphere of exchange is, t is termed a second purely social nature, entirely abstract in makeup. They are both called nature to point to the fact that they constitute worlds equally spatio-temporal by reality and inextricably interwoven in our social life. The ancient legend of King Midas, who wished for everything he touched to turn to gold and died upon having his wish fulfilled, vividly illustrates how contrasting in reality and yet how closely associated in our minds both these natures are. This, in the briefest way, is the foundation on which I shall base my historical and logical explanation of the birth of philosophy in Greek society of slave labor and of the birth of modern science in European society based on wage labor. To substantiate my views, three points have to be established. A, that commodity exchange is an original source of abstraction. B, that this abstraction contains the formal elements essential for the cognitive faculty of conceptual thinking. C, that the real abstraction operating in exchange engenders the ideal abstraction basic to Greek philosophy and to modern science. On the first point, it is necessary to recapitulate the points made so far. Commodity exchange is abstract because it excludes use. That is to say, the action, the action of exchange excludes the action of use. But while exchange banishes use from the actions of people, it does not banish it from their minds. The minds of the exchanging agents must be occupied with the purposes which prompt them to perform their, their deal of exchange. Therefore, while it is necessary that their action of exchange should be abstract from use, there is also necessity that their minds should not be. The action alone is abstract. The abstractness of their action will, as a consequence, escape the minds of the people performing it in exchange, or it. In exchange, the action is social. The minds are private. Thus, the action and the thinking of people part company in exchange and go different ways. In pursuing point B of our theses, we shall take the way of the action of exchange, and this will occupy the next two chapters. For point C, we shall turn to the thinking of the commodity owners and their philosophical spokesmen in part two of the book. Chapter five, economics and knowledge. Oops. How does society hold together when production is carried out independently by private producers? and all forms of previous production in common have broken asunder. On such a basis, society can cohere in no other way than by the buying and selling of the products as commodities. Private production becomes increasingly specialized and the producers become increasingly dependent upon one another according to the division of labor reigning between them. The only solution to their interdependence is commodity exchange. The nexus of society is established by the network of exchange and by nothing else. It is my buying my coat, not my wearing it, which forms part of the social nexus, just as it is the selling, not the making of it. Therefore, to talk of the social nexus, or as we may call it, the social synthesis, we have to talk of exchange and not of use. In enforcing the separation from use, or more precisely, from the actions of use, the activities of exchange presuppose the market as a time and space bound vacuum, devoid of all inter exchange of man with nature. What enables commodity exchange to perform its socializing function, 
to affect the social synthesis is the abstractness from everything relating to use. Our question could thus also be re rephrased in the paradoxical form. How is pure socialization possible? The word pure here conforming to the same criteria of pureness, which Kant applies to his concept of pure mathematics and pure science. In this wording, our question offers a time and space bound and historical corollary to the Kantian inquiry into the conditions by which pure mathematics and pure science are possible. Kant's inquiry was an idealistic one. Translated into Marxist terms, it reads, how is objective knowledge of nature possible from sources other than manual labor? Formulated in this way, our questions aim directly at the pivotal point of the division between mental and manual labor, a division which is a socially necessary condition of the capitalist mode of production. These remarks should show how our form analysis of the commodity abstraction can serve the historical materialist critique of the traditional theory of knowledge as a complement to Marx's critique of political economy. This merits further elucidation. In commodity exchange, the action and the consciousness of people go separate ways. Only the action is abstract. <clears throat> the consciousness of the actors is not. The abstractness of their action is hidden to the people performing it. The action the actions of exchange are reduced to strict uniformity, eliminating the differences of people, commodities, locality, and date. The uniformity finds expression in the monetary function of one of the commodities acting as the common denominator to all the others. The relations of exchange transacted in a market express themselves in quantitative differences of this uniform denominator as different prices and create a system of social communication of actions performed by individuals in complete independence of one another and oblivious of the socializing effect involved. The pivot of this mode of socialization is the abstraction intrinsic to the action of exchange. This abstraction is the dominating form element of commodity exchange to which we give an even wider significance than did Marx, who was the first to discover it. The chief difference distinguishing the Marxian treatment of economics from the bourgeois one lies in the importance accorded to the formal aspects of economic reality, the understanding of form as attached to being and not only to thinking, was the main principle of dialectics which Marx drew from Hegel. Political economy has indeed analyzed value and its magnitude, however incompletely and has uncovered the content concealed within these forms, but it has never once asked the question why this content has assumed this particular form. That is to say, why labor is expressed in value and why the measurement of labor by its duration is expressed in the magnitude of the value of the product. This Marxian sense of the objective necessity and the anonymity of the formal developments of economic life and its sheer historical reality excels in the analysis of the commodity and of the genesis of its monetary expression. Thus, the difference between the Marxian critique of political economy and her critique of idealistic epistemology cannot be confined to the simple contrast between the economics of the magnitude of values and the formal aspect of value and commodity exchange. Both are inseparably linked in the Marxian analysis. Our interest centers on the conversion of the forms of the social being in the epochs of commodity production into the form of cognition peculiar to these epochs. Marx clearly indicates the way in which this conversion takes place. The separation of action and consciousness of people engaged in exchange make it impossible for the forms of exchange to impart themselves to the human mind at the source of these forms. The abstraction applying to the mere action of exchange produces its own practical results, the principal one of which is the emergence of money. Marx has analyzed this process in great detail in the first chapter of Capital and sums it up again as follows. The historical broadening and deepening of the phenomenon of exchange develops the opposition between use value and value, which is latent in the nature of the commodity. 
the need to give an external expression to this opposition for the purposes of commercial intercourse produces the drive towards an independent form of value, which finds neither rest nor peace until the independent form has been achieved by the differentiation of commodities into commodities and money. At the same rate, then, as the transformation of the products of labor into the commodities or into commodities is accomplished, one particular commodity is transformed into money. It might be argued, however, that Marx's analysis of the commodity rules out a purely formal analysis analysis of the exchange abstraction because, to Marx, the abstractness of value always transmits itself to labor and finds its real meaning in abstract human labor as the economic substance of value. On the other hand, there are places where Marx contemplates the exchange relation between commodities taking a certain shape independently of the quantitative aspect. But even where the form of value is considered as related to labor, this relation is often presented as an implication consequent upon the formal characteristic of exchange. Particularly is this the case where the law of value is shown in its actual mode of operation. Men do not therefore bring the product of their labor into relation with each other as value because they see these objects merely as the material integuments of homogeneous human labor. The reverse is true by equating their different products to each other in exchange as values they equate their different kinds of labor as human labor. They do this without being aware of it. And more clearly, the production of commodities must be fully developed before the scientific conviction emerges from experience itself that all the different kinds of private labor, which are carried on independently of each other, and yet as spontaneously developed branches of the social division of labor, are in a situation of all around, or all around dependence on each other are continually being reduced to the quantitative proportions in which society requires them. The reason for this reduction is that in the midst of the accidental and ever fluctuating exchange relations between the products, the labor time socially necessary to produce them asserts itself as a regulative law of nature. In the same way, the law of gravity asserts itself when a person's house collapses on top of him. The determination of the magnitude of value by labor time is therefore a secret hidden under the apparent movements and the relative values of commodities. Surely the exchange relations must have the formal ability to weave a web of social coherence among the mass of private individuals, all acting independently of one another before. By the action of these exchange relations, their labor spent on all the multi-variety of products can be quantified proportionately to the social needs. Very probably a case could be made for either interpretation from the text of Marx's writings, but neither shall I employ the length of time required for such a Marxolog Marxological controversy, nor shall I make my conviction, conviction dependent upon its outcome. I shall define the purely formal capacity of the exchange abstraction and its social function as I see it and produce to prove its reality on the evidence of detailed analysis. This conviction of mine that the commodity form, to use Marx's expression, can be analyzed as a phenomenon of its own in separation from the economic issues does mark a difference from the Marxian theory, but only in the sense that it adds to this theory. The formal analysis of the commodity holds the key not only to the critique of political economy, but also to the historical explanation of the abstract conceptual mode of thinking and of the division of intellectual and manual labor, which came into existence with it. One thing is certain, the rights or wrongs of my deviation from Marx cannot be decided in the abstract, but only in the light of the results. People become aware of the exchange abstraction only when they come face to face with the result which their own actions have engendered behind their backs. As Marx says, in money, the exchange abstraction achieves concentrated representation, but a mere functional one embodied in a coin. It is not recognizable in its true identity as abstract form, but disguised as a thing one carries about in one's pocket, hands out to others or receives from them. Marx says explicitly that the value abstraction never assumes a representation as such, 
since the only expression it ever finds is the equation of one commodity with the use value of another. The gold or silver or other matter which lends to money it, its palpable and visible body is merely a metaphor of the value abstraction it, embod it embodies, not this abstraction itself. But I set out to argue that the abstractness operating in exchange and reflected in value does nevertheless find an identical expression, namely the abstract intellect or the so-called pure understanding, the cognitive source of scientific knowledge. To prove this to be the true historical explanation of the enigmatic cognitive faculties of civilized man, we must carry out an isolated analysis of the formal characteristics of commodity exchange in complete methodological separation from any consideration of the mag magnitude of value and the role of human labor associated with it. These considerations are concerned with the economics of exchange and have been dealt with by Marx in his critique of political economy and remain unaffected by our inquiry. Equally unaffected are the forms of consciousness which are part of the economic life of society and all those mental forms residing under the name of ide ideologies. These do not concern our present study, which is to be understood as an attempt purely at a critique of idealistic epistemology, complementary to Marx's critique of political economy, but based on a systematic foundation of its own.